Well, it's been a uh, it's been a great weekend, hasn't it? For two of you, I mean the Braves won. Come on, people! Of course, it's been a good weekend. Yes, and it was cool because last night after the game, which was an exciting game. I mean, if you saw the thing, the whole the whole series was great. Um, if you saw it. The, 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 the people, the, the fans, they stuck around. And, you know, the stadium's not, it's not small. It's, there's just this wall of people, tons of people. And the team is down there on the field, and everybody's moving around. Everybody's celebrating and having a good old time. And they had this, they had this presentation afterwards, and they, they lift up the trophy for the National League champs and all that. And then, and then they get the most valuable player for the National League Championship Series, Eddie Rosario, not really necessarily a household name, the man hit 560 over the, over the course of the, and I mean, facing Los Angeles Dodgers pitching, hit 560 and hit the three-run home run that really won it for them last night. And so he got that trophy and he lifts it up and everybody's, you, you. And I, let me just tell you, heaven, heaven is going to be a lot like that. God is going to be sitting on his throne, and people, they're not going to be doing the tomahawk chop, but they are going to be singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. It's going to happen. Guaranteed fact. It's been called the material cause of the Reformation, meaning that if you, if you really want where the you know, this whole Reformation thing that we've been talking about, the, the five sole, you know, the five solas, solos, alones. We can, we can hear that and it sounds like, um, it might just sound like a, a, a presentation or a lecture. It might be theory, it might be doctrine, those kinds of things. The material cause, though, is... Kind of like, where does, the, where does the rubber meet the road? If you were to boil it down to one thing that really, really matters, the material cause, it's this. It's this. Martin Luther himself called it the article upon which the church stands or falls. He also said, without this doctrine, listen now, because this, this should be important to you if like what we're doing in here matters, if uh, without this doctrine, the church cannot last one hour. What are we talking about? In fact, in fact R.C. Sproul, who I've borrowed for a, a, a good chunk of, uh, of part of this message, he said, without this doctrine, we dwell in darkness and God is not known. That's, that's some pretty heavy stuff that we're talking about. What is it? Sola fide. It's Latin for faith alone. Faith alone. It's, it's a solo. It stands by itself, faith. Luther called it, he says, the doctrine of sola fide, he said, is the head and cornerstone of the gospel. That's weighty. John Calvin said, justification by faith alone is the hinge upon which everything turns. Carl Truman said, all the doctrine of Protestantism, that's everything that we believe, is born, comes out of justification by faith alone. Folks, without what I'm going to talk about today, we don't exist. Everything that we say that we believe crumbles in front of us. That's how big of a deal this is. Sole fide, faith alone, answers the two most important questions that you will ever ask. Did you catch that? The two most important questions you will ever ask answered in this two-word phrase. Those two questions are this. How can a person be right with God, and how can we stand before the Holy One? How can we be right with God? And when we face God, how are we going to be able to stand there? I mean, he's the holy one burning in righteousness. How can we stand in front of that? Faith alone. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1, just by way of kickoff, if you will. Galatians chapter 1, 
a passage that is familiar if you've been in Bible circles for a while. Paul is going to say something that is very pointed, very strong, and very direct. And he ain't playing. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, would almost actually would almost seem controversial if it wasn't Bible. If I said it, you didn't know it was in the Bible, you'd be like, oh, goodness, man, that's, that's pretty harsh there, Lane. You're not very open minded, are you? Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am amazed, I'm astounded, I'm perplexed. I just, it blows my mind that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. I mean, it's not, it's not really good news. I, we can't even call it the gospel. Only there are some of you who are, dis, who, there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, Paul says like me, doesn't matter, even if, even if an apostle stands before you or an angel from heaven should preach to you the gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, damned to hell is where this person ought to go if they try to give you a gospel other than what we've already told you. <laughs> wow. You ever heard a preacher get up and say, they ought to go to hell, I mean like of his own volition? That's rough, man. That's exactly what Paul's saying. In fact, he, he wants to make sure that like, he's not mincing words, that people can't, like, I don't think he really said that. Did he really say that? So Paul's like, well, okay, so in case you missed it, let's just kind of give an echo to that. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Well, what on earth is it that they are talking about that would be that bad? Skip over to the next chapter and look at verse 15. Galatians 2.15 says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now, he doesn't mean that he is morally perfect. It just means they had the Ten Commandments as a Jew. He had the Ten Commandments. He was following the Ten Commandments. The Gentiles did not. He said, but even in light of that, here's the, here's the issue. Verse 16, nevertheless, even though we've got the law and we have done our best to follow the law, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. No one will be saved apart from faith, and works aren't going to cut it for you. It is by faith alone. Now, why was this such a big deal? Why did, why did Luther have to make... Martin Luther, why did he have to make such a big deal about, about faith alone? What is the context of that? How we got there? I hope you have an outline that you are able to pick up on either, uh, either entrance or if you're online, you can hit the resources tab and, uh, and one will pop up there. You can print it out, take notes on that if you so choose. Let me remind you of the two questions that we asked. The two questions are, how can a person be right with God? And how can we stand before the Holy One? It's about this issue of justification, as how Paul put it here in the book of Galatians. Or how, how is God's grace, we talked about grace last week, grace alone, how is that grace activated in my life? In other words, he's got this grace that's out there that he wants to extend. He's got this gift that he wants to give to me. He wants to do so freely. How is it that I am going to receive that gift? How does it become a part of me other than just something that is out there? How does it personally involve me? That was the issue at stake in the Reformation. Now, again, I'm going to simply give background information. I have no interest whatsoever in attacking another denomination, another religion, or the Roman Catholic Church. I just want to tell you, this is what was being taught in that day, and therefore this is what, this is what spurred Martin Luther to come out with his 95 Theses. And so let me just kind of give you a little bit of the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church both then and today. 
For the Roman Catholic Church, justification is accomplished through administration of the sacraments. That's how the sinner receives the grace of God, is through the sacraments, and specifically through the sacrament of baptism. In fact, when I shared, uh, when I shared some of the uh, beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church, and I printed off that, uh, that uh, doctrinal sheet from the church in, um, in Florida, that's exactly what it said to this day. In baptism, for them, the grace of justification is infused, or it is poured into the soul of its recipients. And here is the phrase that is used, by the working of the works. In other words, by the power of the sacrament. It is poured into those who are baptized. So that the one baptized eventually must cooperate with it and assent to it. In other words, grow into that to such an extent that real righteousness becomes a part of who they are. So if we're going to be justified, here's, here's the thing. We're baptized, and, um, and so in that baptism, we must grow toward righteousness. And that is how we are in, in, with our works, and that is how we are justified in God's sight. We're in that state of justification until the person kills that grace through the commission of what they call a mortal sin. Mortal sin is defined that, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not just when you kill somebody. Mortal sin is called that but it, because they believe that it kills the grace of justification. I like what Calvin, how he responded to that. He said, every sin is mortal in that it deserves death. But for the Roman Catholic Church, when mortal sin is committed, the faith remains but the justification is destroyed. So what that means is, for the Roman Catholics, you can have faith without justification because of mortal sin. And if you commit mortal sin, you have to be justified again. And that occurs through what the church, what the Catholic Church calls a second plank of justification. It's, it's a nautical term. They're saying that those who, have, those who have committed this mortal sin have shipwrecked their faith, and so they have to get on a second plank. And if you, lo if you lost that justification, you can get it back through the sacrament of penance. That's where that sacrament comes from. Confession, contrition, priestly absolution works of satisfa satisfaction. These, these gain merit for the sinner before God. Now, it would be slanderous. I like what R.C. Sproul said here. He said it would be slander that the Roman Catholic Church believes in pure Pelagianism. You remember we talked about Pelagius last week who said that you can you can earn your way to salvation by your works and by your works alone. You can, you can get that kind of merit before God. It was, listen, it would be slander to say that the Catholic Church believes that in salvation by works. I mean, in her worst hour, the Roman Catholic Church never believed that. In fact, it condemned it several times in its, in its worldwide conventions that we talked about. What they believe is they believe in grace and they believe that faith are necessary components. And for them, faith initiates justification. In other words, it is necessary to be justified. The problem is that for them, it is not a sufficient condition. In other words, you got to have faith. But you remember what we said the big difference between Catholicism and Protestantism is? Is the big word, and. They don't think you're saved by works. They believe you got to have faith. You just got to have faith and other stuff. Faith and works. You gotta have faith, but you gotta have something added to it. Now, in order to in order to help you understand how Martin Luther got to where he got, it's also illustrative and interesting to, to see where this doctrine took them, but it also helps us to see where Luther how he came to, to go in the direction that he went. Because there are a small number of people throughout history who were so righteous, so good, 
that they had more merit than they needed to get into the kingdom. I mean, they had like, it's what they called, it's what they called super merits. It's kind of loosely called that. But they, they had more merit than they needed to get into the kingdom. And so those super merits were deposited into what they call the treasury of the saints. Now, for, for those of us who are not immersed in that teaching, I don't, I don't want to oversimplify it, but for, for us to, to be able to understand it, you can just think of it as this, as this huge ethereal bank account of merits that are out there somewhere. And it is administrated, this bank account is administrated by the church so that they can, at the authority of the church, they can take those merits and they can apply them to someone else. This is what gave, led to the practice of indulgences. Because then they can take, you, you do these indulgences, you buy this piece of paper, they can take some merits and put it onto your account. And when you, when you give with a heart of faith, the church has the authority to draw from this bank the merits that were earned by these other saints and give to these people in purgatory. Now, the word purgatory, it, the, the, uh, uh, the root word is the word purge. It's where they believe you go till you can purge all of your sins and make yourself right for heaven. But in this, in this uh, practice that they have had, you can get these merits and you can earn these merits on behalf of someone who has gone on before you, who has died before you, and help them get out of purgatory faster and get them into heaven. And in 1510, Luther made a pilgrimage to Rome. And in Rome, there were these sacred steps at what they call the Lateran Church. This is where the Pope resided before his residence in this modern day. They had these sacred steps that were believed to be where Jesus climbed in the night of his trial. And the church decreed that if a person would make a pilgrimage to this Lateran church, and they went up those stairs on their knees, and at each step, they would say their prayers, they would say Hail Marys, and, and recite some kind of a prayer, that when they got to the, stop, to the top of the staircase, they, receive, they would receive so many indulgences that could be passed on to their dead relatives who were in purgatory. So Luther made this pilgrimage in 1510. And this is where he had his crisis. Because he did this thing. He went up each stairs, each of those stairs, on his knees. And he said his prayers. And he said his Hail Marys. And when he got to the top, he famously muttered these words, Who knows if it is true? He had a priest, a prominent priest, who was asking, Did this work? Is this any good? The medieval the theologians of his day said, You can be declared righteous when you are doing the very best that you can. But Martin Luther was, he was haunted by not knowing if he had given his very best. So it forced him to go back and to study the Word. And when he studied the Word, and remember Sola Scriptura, the Word only, he found that there was nothing in there of purgatory or papal indulgences. The only thing he could find was the gospel of justification by faith alone. Sola fide. That is how we get here. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean? It means a great deal, and I hope that you will follow along with me there in your outline. First of all, we will begin with the word justification. This is where it all begins. Justification. How can a person be right before God? How can we stand before the Holy One? Justification means, here in your outline, to declare righteous. I pronounce you are righteous. That's what justification means. It means to announce, accept, and treat as just. And in your outline, I purposefully have you write the word except. You 
can be accepted by a holy God. To announce, accept, and treat as just. On the one hand, we are not legally liable. In other words, we don't have to pay the price. We don't have to go to jail. We don't have to pay a fine. We don't have to do any of that. We are not legally liable. And on the other hand, it gets even better than that. We are entitled to all privileges of those who have kept the law. The old evangelists used to like to to say, just if I'd never sinned justified. Just if I had never sinned. That is justification. Now, it doesn't stop there. Justification because of, somebody might say, well, but wait, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I, I realize my sin. I look at myself and I don't see someone who is righteous. How does that happen? Here's how. Justification because of imputed righteousness. Here's what imputed means. So you might want to underline, if you're taking those notes, you might want to underline the word imputed because that's what we're focusing on in this section. Webster's Dictionary says it means to credit to a person or cause, to attribute, to take something from one account and put it into another account. And suddenly this account that that was empty is now full. That's what it means to impute. Biblically speaking, it means to put down to a person's account. Philemon chapter 18 is a great example of that. Paul is, Paul is writing to Philemon and he's talking about his slave Onesimus. And he says, listen, I, I know Onesimus has run away from you and if he has caused you any harm, if he has cost, cost you any kind of money or any kind of, um, any kind of uh, property or anything, he says, put that on my account. That's what imputed means. It's not mine, but I will take it. I want you to put it on my account and I will pay it. Now, there are three times in Scripture where something is imputed. Number one, we talked about this last week out of Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Adam's sin is imputed to the human race. We are guilty in Adam's sin. We didn't bite the fruit, right? But we are imputed of that sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 21. Number two, and this, is, this part is not in your outline. You don't have blanks here. This is, this is free and extra. Number two, the sin of the, hum, of, of the human race is imputed to Christ. Now, it won't be too long before we start hearing Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6, where he, our Our iniquities have fallen upon him. What is ours becomes his. We saw last week, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to become sin. Our sin imputed to Christ, put on his account. And listen, folks, he's the only one who can afford all of that. And then number three, is the righteousness of God is imputed to the believer. It is put on our account. Merrill F. Unger said the theme, this is the whole theme of the book of Romans. God's righteousness becomes our righteousness. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ's infinite, never-ending, never-expiring merit is credited to the meritless, to us. Now, how can that happen? That that just almost seems like nuts. I mean, that's all crazy or impossible or doesn't make sense, illogical. How does that happen? Justification because of the imputed righteousness of Christ through faith. Write down this reference. Romans chapter 4 and in verse 3. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He just believed. All the good things Abraham did, that didn't do anything for him. He believed God 
and it was credited to him as righteousness. It is called, faith is called the entry point through which grace enters. It's how we get grace. Yesterday I went in my backyard and my father-in-law had given me five little gardenian nubs, but they had some root to them. He had done this fancy thing. He knows how to do all that kind of stuff. He gave me five. I went to my backyard, found me a little, little section that I thought was good. I, I like sectioned it off and dug up everything that was in there. I didn't have a tiller, so I just used my, my, my uh, shovel and tore that thing up, and I planted those plants in there. I spaced them out just right. I mean, I had my, I had my, my tape measure out because I wanted to make sure they were spaced just right apart. Got it all done, got the dirt in there, went and got some pine straw, put some pine straw there. I should have brought a picture for y'all to see, man. I'm so proud of that thing. These little nubs about that big growing up out of there. You can't hardly even see them above above the pine straw because I put so much pine straw in there. And you know what I did? I went and I got got my garden hose. And I've used this illustration before, not that part because that just happened yesterday. But I got my my, my, my hose and I brought it over there and I watered every one of those plants. Now, I was connected to a water source that, to my knowledge, is never going to end. I've never come to the end of that water, ever. How am I going to get the water from that spigot to where I need them in that plant? Through the hose. How are you going to get the infinite, matchless grace of God into your life? Faith. The same way the water got from the spigot to the plant. That's how you're going to get the grace of God to your life. Faith is the only way. It is the only avenue through which we receive the grace of God. The instrument of justification is not baptism. It's not confession. It's not any work at all. Luther said the gospel destroys all of this merit. We come with nothing in our hands. It's faith. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't aid it. You can't add to it. Anything else is another gospel which is not a gospel at all. I love what Luther said here. He said, the love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to him. He can look all over the earth, and he's not going to find somebody say, oh, yeah, that, that works for me. He works for me. She works for me. I like how they've turned out. It doesn't happen. He has to create it, and so that's exactly what he did. I mean, we, we love, but we love because we find something lovable. I'm, I married my wife 26 years ago is because I found something in her that I loved. God looks at us, and he doesn't really see anything that's lovely. So he creates something that is lovely. And we receive that through faith and through faith alone. Now, why does, this, why does it still matter? And I'll wrap up with this. Why, why does this still matter? Why is it that we are talking about it other than the fact that your very salvation hinges upon it? Here, here, are, here are four things that I would say, and I hope you write these down because... If you are ever in doubt, here it goes. All that Christ is and did is mine because of justification by faith, through faith alone. All that Christ is and did is mine. Somebody just took my picture. Wasn't that nice? Number two, all my sins are done away with. They're gone. They're done. (laughs) There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Number three, my place in heaven is guaranteed. Guaranteed. And then fourth, maybe this could all be summarized with the fourth thing there. I am at peace with God. You might feel anxious today. You don't have to feel anxious. We can be at peace with God. Listen, when guilt overwhelms you, sola fide. 
You're not sure if God loves you or accepts you. Sola fide. You're not sure if you can be saved after what you have done, after all the things that you have messed up in your life. Sola fide. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord in faith will be saved. And if you are struggling in your faith today, or if you look at your life and you think, I'm just not worth it, even a God like that can't love me, or you might be saying, hey, I want to, if, if God can love me, I want, I want more of that. Can you, can you show me how? Then I want, you to, I want you to contact us. I want you to connect with us. We want to show you how to come in contact with this God who loves you so much who died for you, who looks at you and sees nothing righteous. All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. There's nothing great about you in and of yourself, but he looks at you and he says, I will give you what makes you lovely. And I'll save you. And I will save you to the uttermost. You want this in your life? Call upon him. Now, if you have questions about what that means, if you... If you, or if you make that decision, or maybe you're just struggling in your walk, and, you, and some of these things you're, have maybe struck a chord with you, and it, it really hit a nerve, and it's something you need to talk about, I want you to reach out to us. You can do that by calling the number that we have, and it's, it's printed in several different places, 912-513-2929. You may want to write that down, put it in your phone or whatever, 912-513-2929, and text the word RESPONSE. If you'll text the word response, that comes to my phone, and we can start a conversation. So if you want to know what it means to be saved, if you want to, which you don't have to have my help, you can just call out to him right now, right where you are, whether you're at home or sitting in here in the front row, back row, upstairs, wherever you might be, you can call upon him right now. But if you, if you want to talk with somebody about that, then I hope that you'll, I hope you'll reach out in this way, and let's begin this conversation. Because, because there is no other way, and there is no, there's nothing else that you have to do that you can do about that. Call out to Him. He wants to love you and accept you and change you. And He can do that, and only He can do that. God, we thank you for sola fide. Our works always fall so short. And so, God, we, it would be helpless if it was up to us. We can't, even, we can't even add to what you've done because of our sinfulness. So we thank you for the love and the grace that you have extended to us. We thank you for sending Jesus to die. We thank you for the power that raised him again on the third day that gives us hope of a resurrection and a renewal of our relationship with you. And so, God, my first prayer is for those who don't know you. And maybe there are some who think that they're just, they're just not worthy. It's just, it just can't happen because of something they've done. It's certainly true that we're not worthy. But, God, you made a way. You paved the way on the cross. And we thank you for that. So that if someone just believes, it will be reckoned unto them as righteousness. Counted imputed to them. And may they experience the newness that comes with that. And Lord, I even pray for your children. Sometimes, sometimes even when we're saved, we're thinking, how could God love me after the way that I've blown it? I've known him and I've still messed it up. Lord, we thank you that your acceptance of us comes at your cost, not ours. And may our hearts be filled with gratitude so that we live the rest of our days for you. Lord, we thank you for sole fide. Now, transform our hearts that ours would match yours and that we would be a shining light for you in a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen.